Good morning, America. This is Yvonne DeVita coming to you from, um, it was sunny in Binghamton yesterday. And as you know, it's dreary today. However, it's warm. So will we walk the dog? That's always the question. Will we walk the dog? And I use the term we loosely because will I go with Tom to walk the dog? Because he will walk the dog regardless. But but let's get back to smart women conversations because that's what we're about today. And I have a, a, a big, big special guest. I mean, big in the sense that we just uh, just wrap our arms around each other if we could, and we're trying to do it through Zoom. I know all of you are also in this time of living in love in the time of Corona. Let's put it out there like that. Um, welcome to the show, Amy. Hi, how are you? doing? So listen, let me tell you about Amy because Amy is a published author and she has um, so many experiences that she's going to share with us on the show about writing, publishing, um, and then marketing your book because you know, Absolutely. you can't write it and put it up and then sit back. That's not how it yeah. works, folks. But we're going to cover some of those topics, and we might have to turn this into an Amy Sojai series because there's a lot <laughs> to talk about here. <laughs> let me tell you, though. Let me tell you why all this is true. Oh, Amy. So she's a certified animal behavior consultant and nationally known authority on pet care and behavior. And that is how I have, have known Amy um, yeah. from Blog Paws. So Amy, there's a lot of blog pause people in my shows, but um, blog pause was the bomb. I well, love blog you pause. Know, blog pause brought together so many smart people. Oh, that was one of the yes. Things. I'm blessed. I'm blessed to be able to have those women on my show, like you. I mean, you began your career as a veterinary technician. Whoa, just like me. Yay! And the award-winning author of more than 35 prescriptive nonfiction pet books, and a pet-centric. Thrillers with Bite fiction series. Now, folks, right. uh, did, did you catch that? So she's <laughs> writing these nonfiction pet books, but she's got these fiction, a fiction series also. This is a talented lady. Amy <laughs> has written widely in the pet field on training, behavior, healthcare, both allopathic and holistic the end health benefits of keeping cats and dogs. And, and that's another place that I know Amy. I mean, she's, she's so much... Um, a voice of authority and expertise on how do I do this with my cat or my dog? Why is my cat doing this? Why is my dog right. doing that? Um, she's the co-founder and past president of the International Cat Writers Association, a certified member of the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants, mm -hmm. um, a fear-free certified trainer, and Dog Writers of Association, Association of America. Um, so she, she isn't just cats and she isn't just dogs. She's, she's pets. Um, Equal opportunity pet lover. Yeah, yeah. No <laughs> birds in there though, Amy. I had a parrot. I had a parrot for a while. That was the first article I ever published was about Venus. Wow. Rise of Venus. Venus was a spectacle Amazon that we re I rescued when I was the vet tech. Yep. Wow. Well, Amy, I'm going to move this over a little. Amy frequently lectures at conferences and gives webinars about writing as well as a variety of pet related issues. She has been featured on ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and in USA Weekend, the New York Times, Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Reader's Digest, Women's Day, Family Circle, <laughs> Women's World, and many other leading. Okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, let's, let's just put it out there. I told you she's a talented lady and and she, she comes by this because of the hard work she puts in. Um, she regularly, regularly appears on national radio and television in connection with her writing. Um, I love this part, Amy. Perhaps most memorably, she represented the cat side and won a nationally televised tongue-in-cheek debate uh, was on NBC Today. Uh, Fox, CNN, and others, arguing whether cats or dogs are the more appropriate White House pets. And you know what? You know, Amy, <laughs> I just, you are just so fantastic. But <laughs> I love that, that little conversation there about whether, <laughs> and not just the White House. It's like, oh, yeah. do you like cats better or dogs better? Are dogs better pets or cats better pets? Well, you know what? 
What are you telling me? Well, at that time, it was it was funny because it was it was uh, Sox Clinton versus Leader Dole. It was that presidential, and they were the premise was the presidential debate are so boring let's have something that's more fun and so yeah. the the publishers of, of dog world and cats magazine sponsored this and i was tapped to do the dog side and a colleague did the dog uh, the cat side and the colleague did the dog side and katie couric voted for cats wow yeah <laughs> well it's so, so interesting but you know besides we'll put that aside because that is another discussion uh, whether cats <laughs> another or day birds <laughs> or whatever animals right. but we, you know you and i both love cats and dogs and, and any pets but Absolutely. you know today today i really wanted to share with the ladies out there uh your experiences writing books because okay. you have um, a background in both traditional publishing and self-publishing. And yes. tell us a little bit of a story about that. What was your journey from one, did you start with self and go to traditional or, or the other way? Right, around? right. Well, I had always, I mean, you know, when I was coming up and, and of course, you know, I started writing when I was 12, you know, so I was <laughs> Then, like many of us, I was writing my stories long and long time ago. I always wanted to have them published and went the traditional route because that's what you did yes. in those days. And I actually um, got my first traditionally published book um, out of the blue. I was writing at that time for Cat Fancy Magazine and had two articles in a December issue uh, of the magazine, which, you know, of course it's now gone. Um, and I came back from Christmas vacation and I had a message from a New York publisher saying, we've already sold the book, but we need somebody to write it. And I called <laughs> Cat Fancy and because I saw your byline and I liked your style. Are you interested? And that was my first book. And it was called, um, The Cat Companion. And after I I had three months to write it, and I used, I love libraries, so I used interlibrary loans and interviewed local veterinarians. And, you know, this was before internet or email. Yeah, yeah. So it was on the phone, uh, finished the book, turned it in, and they said, you know, it occurs to us, maybe you know about dogs, you want to do the dog version. <laughs> and so I did the dog version. Those were my first two books, and they sold huge. They were, uh, they were work for hires. I was paid, I think, $3,000 for each book. Holy and God. the cat book sold like 75,000 copies and was a book of book club thing, but it got me, that was on my resume. It helped get me my agent later. So there's different ways that you can go about this. So that was, that was traditional publishing. Mm -hmm. uh, I got my agent um, and we sold about 15 books together. And then the internet um, kind of put me out of business. I say publishing went kerflui. It goes through these these uh, uh, stages, and so I had to kind of reinvent myself. And I thought for a while that I was done. I wasn't. My agent couldn't sell anything, um, and so I quit. Wow. And um, I started um, teaching high school choir because that was my major in school was music, music and theater was my double major in school. And so I was doing that, but I was so bored and so frustrated that I started also writing um, a thriller that I had always wanted to read and nobody was writing what I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And that ended up getting published. And then I had a friend who was kind of at the very beginning of doing the self-publishing things when Kindles were starting out. Mm -hmm. And she contacted me and she said, you know, we've got a lot of fiction, but we don't have nonfiction. Would you be interested in republishing your nonfiction? Because it had all gone out of print. And my agent at the time was brilliant, got all my rights back. Oh, so boy. I had the rights and I just updated everything, republished. And today they're selling better. And I'm making more money on those backlist books than I ever did. Did when I when they first came out well, so you you said something really important there um, mm -hmm. your agent got your rights back oh it's very important it's harder people, today but yeah, then you need to understand what that means yeah. because um, you know we we never when I was a publisher I did print on demand and we made um, you know a point of making sure everyone knew that we don't take any of your rights if you go to the big publishers, maybe this book could get published, but uh -huh. then they own the rights. 
back then they really tried to hold tightly to all the rights that they could. And if your book mm -hmm. goes out of print, then it goes out of print. Right. And that, and that was the issue there. And I've had some books I had to really fight about to get, get them back yeah. uh, because now they're in competition with new things that I'm writing. So I don't want extraneous yep. stuff out there diluting my brand when I have no control over it. Yeah. So the, basically when you are selling a book, uh, you are licensing it. It's like, um, it's like licensing or renting a leasing a car. Ah, uh, so good. they, they have the right to use it and drive that car or drive that book. But when they're no longer using it, it's parked in the garage and it's no longer earning or anything, you get to, to get those rights back. So it's very important to check if you are publishing with New York or with a, even a small press, mm -hmm. check all the fine print and find out there's a um, um, clause, it's called the rights reversion clause and check in there, what does it take to get your rights back? Because it used to be, it would be out of print for X amount of time or not selling X number of books. Well, now with eBooks, it's never out of print. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that you specify exactly what out of print means. Did it not sell X number in this term? That's and a good you know, point. Kind of thing. Yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't really thought about that. Wow. Um, so now that you're, w w tell us what you're writing now, the kinds of books that you're writing. You, I know you and I talked, you have some books you can show us. One of the things oh, yeah. I would also like you to talk about is the cover design. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, and good story there. Um, I think I've, I may have even thrown away some of the old covers because I had my first covers on my independently published book. They sucked <laughs> they were really bad, um, but I've gotten better. And I know, I know how to, to design now. And there are people who will do cover right. design for yep. you. Uh, and I, I did, one of yeah. them is, is one of my conversations. She's oh, good this week. And she, she actually taught me a few things about cover design. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. So she's very talented, but yeah. So, so this, this is, um, this is Lost and Found. This is the first book in my series, uh, my thriller series. Uh, and this is about the fifth incarnation of the cover. It's, it's probably the best. Uh, I think it's the best of the bunch. So Lost and Found takes place during a blizzard. So you've got kind of the ice and everything. But what I did, I came up with the icons because my main character is a behaviorist that has a service dog that's a German shepherd. Yeah. And the German Shepherd has his own viewpoint chapters, which yeah. I love. It's so much fun to write. So yeah. that Lost and Found was the first, Hide and Seek was the second. So it's exactly the same yeah. icon. Yeah. yeah. It ties everything together. Show and Tell was the third. And then the fourth one introduced brand new characters. So this oh. was Hide or Seek. And there was a Rottweiler police puppy in training for, um, you know, so, so introduced a new one. And the next one has, again, a totally different icon yeah. with it, but it's the same basic thing. Right. And that one is hit, hit and run. And I'm working on that one. That one's in process now. In fact, I'm launching my contest um, tomorrow for name that dog, name that cat character. I do that with each book. And so people get a chance to I'm getting, um, I'm getting goosebumps. nominate their pets. Yeah, you're giving me goosebumps because this is what <laughs> This is what I want to see in the world. I want to see more books like more fiction books like that because pets and, and dogs and cats and birds or whatever, they're so integral to our lives. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they, they mean something to us. They're not just um, items or possessions. And, and you and I know back in our blog pause days, we didn't talk about um, pet ownership. We talked about pet parenting, and it, yep. you know, there's a there's a lot of women out there that don't like that. But uh, so I'm getting goosebumps about that. But you also talked about um, what did you talk about that I wanted to mention. You were talking about the series, and you were talking about well, the viewpoint character, the dog that has his own character, and see, he does not talk. The dog character, and this was the thing that, you know, I got a lot of pushback early on in my career. That's what I wanted to write. And they would say, no, it's a kid's book. Dogs talk in kids' books. And I said, no, this is a thriller. This is not a children's book. The, the reason I had the dog um, viewpoint was because he, early on, he's partnered with an autistic child. And I had no idea to write autistic viewpoint. 
So I put it in the viewpoint of the dog and the dog thinks and experiences the world as a dog and he communicates mm -hmm. as a dog. Mm -hmm. And so it's, or from my perspective as, as a behavior consultant, uh, he would say um, his, his thought process might be, uh, why, why is he staring at me? He's not looking away like a polite dog would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, or this, this smell, um, this, oh, I can, I can tell that she's very upset. Her scent just changed, you know, those kinds of things, yeah. um, the ears back, you know, all of those types of things. And I get reviews saying, that's why my dog did that. Or that's yeah. why yeah. the cat is, because there's a cat in there. It's a trained Maine Coon cat as well. <laughs> so it's a way for me to reach a whole nother audience with the nonfiction, giving them information. And they're all kind of pet centric types of plot lines also. So I'm, I call it edutainment. Yes. You're, you're, yes. you're not lecturing, well, but you're, they're learning. And then I have a fact, fact or fiction section in the, in the, in the back that says, this is true. This I made up. Ah. This could be true with all of the citations and everything. When Feline Foundation's in there, all of these really good resources. So it's, it's based on my publisher at the time. Uh, he called it factual fiction. That's what he, he wrote his Well, story. and that, uh, you know, I do remember what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about your contest. But that factual okay. fiction thing is really, really important to remember. Now, I'm so impressed you have the series going on. I love that people got to see that the covers all tie together. Right. So it's it's the branding. Different. Right. Yes. Branding. If you put them on a shelf, you know that all those books belong together. We did that when I when I was a publisher. The but, the other thing, real quick on the on the covers, you have to remember though, if this shrinks to postage stamp size, like on your phone, yep. will people be able to read the right. title? Will right. they recognize it? So it has to. It it can be a beautiful physical book. Mm -hmm. You know these are these are the latest nonfiction books. Ah. Okay, but if it's shrunk down to postage stamp size, mm -hmm. are people going to be able to read it? Yep. And also the title, especially yeah. nonfiction, think SEO in your title because yeah. Amazon's the biggest search engine in the world and that's how you sell books. People you know, type I, in there, I, you know, what they're looking for and if your title catches it, that's it. Is your, let me see the, the cat and dog one again, the one you just held up. And this um, is back. Yeah, great. And so the the book um, designer whose whose video will go up in I don't know eight is four ten. <laughs> so okay. be, so the, the back folks, she's back. Um, she said your name. Make sure your name is big enough for people to see. Exactly. Today, we're, I mean, you're not showing it in yours, but so many fiction authors, the name is bigger than the title. Well, it depends on, it. in wow. traditional publishing, you earned that right to have your name above the title yes. after you had sold a certain number and it was big. So the name of the author was the brand. You know, Jonathan Kellerman is the brand. Nobody remembers the individual titles. They remember Jonathan Kellerman. They remember, you know, right. Lillian Jackson Braun. They remember, right. those are brand names, okay? Mm -hmm. My name's not a brand at this point. Uh, I'm hoping it will be, and I'm doing more with that. But at this point, to have dog life or to have cat life would work out better. And plus, you remember on on the the um, page on Amazon or on Barnes and Noble or whatever, it not only has cat life, it has the subtitle, which is also SEO. And the right. subtitle is celebrating the history, culture, and love of the cat. So all of those things. And then in the description, you again put in SEO terms so that it picks it up in the description as well. Right, right. Well, let's get back then to the contest because, you know, people can learn from this that, that the traditional um, publishing way isn't as let's say the self-publishing is more respected today. And I, I will say, Amy, 
I will take some credit for it. I'm going to give you credit for it because we still expect our self-published book to be as good, both oh. in quality and design, as yeah. any traditionally published book. I mean, there are some out there that are not, but today, uh, a lot of authors are self-publishing. And so... Yeah. Regardless of how you publish folks, let me tell you a secret. You need to market the book. Amy, tell us what you're doing with your contest. Uh, uh, well, this, this is something I started just for fun with the very first book and it is so popular that every sing single book now, when I have a new book coming out, I add in pet characters and then I allow my readers to nominate their pet names and it may be a living pet or a pet from their past or whatever. I describe what the pet needs to be able to do and they describe their pet. Mm -hmm. And then I choose kind of the top ones, put them on a poll and they get to vote and campaign to have the winning name. And then the winners get not only the pet's name becomes a character in the book, but they get a copy of the book. They get acknowledgement that you learn about. Nice. And some of them that, in fact, which one was it? I think it was the second book, Hide and Seek. Um, lady nominated her dog and she described the dog and the dog was um, um, supposed to be um, uh, a therapy dog at a nursing center. So she, she described her dog and she said, yeah, my dog does therapy for me, but my dog also goes around the neighborhood and steals laundry and brings it home and takes care of other. And so I put that in the book. Awesome. So all these little idiosyncrasies that the pet may have, you can include those and they give me the best ideas. I sent a, a note out asking, okay, well, what, what other kinds of things might Shadow or Macy, the cat, uh, Maine Coon cat, do? And they said, well, Macy, maybe Macy sleeps on his back. I said, okay, yeah, Karma does that. Well, maybe maybe um, Shadow could turn the lights on and off, you know, one of those paw things. Said, yeah. Yeah, that's good. So they're giving me all these ideas. I incorporate these in. They have ownership in the book because yeah. without the readers, you have nothing. Right. You have absolutely nothing. Right. So, and this is so key. Um, the other thing is you're doing this before the book is published. Oh, yeah. I, I you know, I have in, I have a, a book I'll be putting up, the Hada, um, or rather book is business card. And one of the things is you need to start marketing and thinking about how, who's going to read your book and how you're going to get it in front of them and how they're going to share it before you're done writing it. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you have to know your audience. I listen to my audience right now. I've, in fact, um, we talked a little about this before we started recording. I'm doing a lot of YouTube now and I do little short bits uh, called Ask Amy. Um, and so people ask me questions, why my dog does this or how can I stop my cat from doing that? And so I'm thinking maybe down the road, I'll use, uh, I'll compile all of those because I've already got it uh, recorded, I could almost do an audiobook first and yes. make this into, you know, little right. short segments or something. I have a series of quick tips books that are, none of them are more than about 60, 70 pages. They're just a little, little yep. short books. Um, and uh, eventually I've, I think I've got six of those, six or seven of those. One of them is, um, my cat hates my vet. <laughs> uh, my dog hates my date. You know, and then what do you do? And put those in a in a combined thing. And those all come from people asking me, well, what do I yes. do? Because the pets, so you listen to what people are asking and then you give them what they're asking. Well, and the, here's the, I love that. And I love to ask Amy, um, you know, connecting and allowing your audience to kind of help you and taking yes. what they're they're saying. So uh, you're very prolific, okay? I don't want people to get scared off and say, well, look at she, she's published all these books and she has all Like I said, books. I was 12. <laughs> well, and me too. And I, I let the cat, you know, do cat and dog, they get to write some of them. So. The, the key here is that you're writing things that you care about. So early on, before we started the recording, folks, Amy and I were talking a little bit because it's been a long time since we saw each other and we were just <laughs> talking like ladies do. Um, and we talked about, you know, where do ideas come from? Where, uh, where does the idea of what you're going to write come from? Now, Amy and I are so full of ideas. We don't have to, uh, that have is enough time, our, right. our end. Um, but, you know, for my point, sometimes my ideas, Amy, I say, 
I start to write the book and it just kind of flops. And I'm like, you know, it really isn't that that was an idea that I have to put aside and then I move yeah. on. But, you know, give us a little bit of feedback from the perspective of, so the women who might be watching, they might want to write fiction. They might want to write a uh, nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, number one, what you learn in school, write what you know. Mm -hmm. um, you can include things you don't know because there's this thing called Google. Google will teach you. Uh, the library, right, Amy? Will teach Fiction, you. you get to make stuff up. And, and that's it. Yeah. So, and, and then talk about the whole idea thing because I, I, I try to wrap myself around that when people yeah. say, what would I write? Yeah, it's, um, I have a... Um, one of the one of the webinars that I teach talks a little bit about that and I talk about the idea tree and you know where do you get your ideas and that, is it a big enough is it a big enough idea for New York is it a good size idea for a niche publisher or for you know de depending on what it is is it is the idea more of an article or a blog post or is it big enough for a whole book yeah. um, if you are blogging I've had colleagues and friends who have taken blog posts and turned them into very, very successful books there you go. Uh, and become um, quite successful doing that. So that's a place. And with, with blog posts, it's great because you get almost immediate feedback if you've got um, an interested audience that are commenting so you can hear from them saying, well, yeah, you said that, but what about this? And mm -hmm. they will give you more. And oftentimes, if you have the idea, it may be a portion of a book. And so think about, well, okay, you start, you know, for instance, cat life. Cat life could have just been about the love we have for our cats. Yep. But I wanted to do, you know, something else. So I've got, you know, celebrating the history. I start out with evolution. Uh -huh. So you've got... You've got a whole section in here. Plus, I just, this is my first try doing a fully colored, colored interior book. So like, here's evolution. Yeah. So you start, you start out, you know, with, with the myocene that started and you can, yes, write what you know, but if you love research, write what you want to know. There you go. I love that. Okay. I love that. So, so yeah, so you can, you can find those things and then it's all about, you know, in school, we learned how to do an outline and everything. That's perfect for nonfiction books. Do an outline. Start with a premise yeah. and see where it leads. And then you've got all of these little leaves and little limbs that go out. And each one of those may be a chapter or a section of a chapter. Yes. And then it's just organizing it. Right. You know, cut and, and paste just, and moving it around. Yeah. The, in the end, it's start writing. Yeah. Sometimes that yeah. All, that's all you need is to start writing take a little thread of an idea and start and and to your point one of the things i think i heard you say amy is okay let's say so from for me and this has happened to me i'll start in, in thinking i'm writing a book and after a couple of um chapters or even just you know 10 pages or something i'll be like this belongs in a different book this is a yeah. this is a chapter yeah. in a different book and sure. Then to your point, you know, within the outline, be flexible. That's why I tell people. Oh yeah. You, you have to edit and change, and you might. And this is what I I remember doing as a book coach and saying, no, this chapter goes here. You have yeah. it, it as a six, and it's really a three. We need to move it up here. And Tom yeah. is helping me with my book right now, and he's like, you know, I think this goes at the end, Yvonne. And I'm like, you're right, it does. So exactly, and outside in help is is a great help. You yeah. know, people because we get so close to it. Yeah. Um, and with, with fiction, you know, there's, there's kind of uh, two camps on the fiction side. There's what they call the pansters yeah. and the outliners. <laughs> and the pansters right by the seat of their pants. They just mm -hmm. sit down and they just write and they write and they write and they write. And the outliners, they plot everything. The plotsters and the, and the pansters. The plotsters, they outline everything first. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of a hybrid between the two. I kind of know, I know the beginning, I know the ending. It's that mushy middle mm -hmm. that is a little bit of a challenge for me. So I know kind of all the major plot points that are going on. And I use a, a program um, called Scrivener that ah. it's 
very, very inexpensive, but I love it because you can, it's, it's, you can write a chapter and then you can move it around really easily. Mm -hmm. And I color code all my chapters who the viewpoint character is. So, you know, my main character is, is red and the dog is blue. And so I can see where they are and I alternate those and I can very easily move them around. And I give myself permission to write the fun stuff first. <laughs> so I love writing in the dog viewpoint chapters. So I'll write those first and kind of, and they can't be back to back mm -hmm. and I can move those around and see, okay, he's, you know, we started here. He's going to be here. How do we get there? Yep. And then you write the in-between portions. Yes. So that's helpful maybe for fiction writers. And mm -hmm. if you are a brilliant panster that's been doing it for years and years, you, you've you already plotted it's on inside your head. It's just you haven't done it here. Yes. So there are people that are very, very good at doing that. And, uh, you know, I have friends that sit down and they write 3,000 words a day. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. My first draft on fiction is painful. No. It takes me forever <laughs> to do it. And then the editing is fun. And I love the editing. And I have friends, it's the exact opposite. But basically, you give yourself permission to just vomit out awful, terrible stuff with fiction. Yes. Get it yes. all on the page. And then you have something to edit. And right. don't go back and reread the same stuff and re-edit it because you will never get beyond chapter two or three. Right. I, I know. Yeah. And we could talk forever about that because... Um, a lot of people just, they you build stop. this perfection. Yeah. It's like it has to be perfect. So they continually go back and try to make it perfect. And sometimes you ruin it. Sometimes yeah. you actually take something out. The action, and if you have readers and you've done that and they say to you, where did that go? That was really good. Why did you move that? You yeah. know, so get out of your own head sometimes and understand that, yes, you Absolutely. can edit it, but you can also over overthink it. Um, yes. So talk a little bit more. We're, we're coming to the end of our time. You and I, uh, you said a word before I started recording, recording called authorpreneur. Yeah. And tell us what authorpreneur is. Well, an authorpreneur, that's, that's kind of a term that's been bandied about in the, in the self-publishing arena for some time now. And it just basically means you are, you own, it's a business. As an author, you own a business. You are for me, my brand is Amy Shujai. Um, so treat it like a business. I not only write books, I also lecture. I do, I have over here, I have a home studio where I do my um, uh, audio books and I, you know, publish those as well. So it's not all your eggs in one basket. You're doing all kinds of things. I write, I'm a contributor to a number of, of websites where I'll, I'll write articles. Uh, I'm in a position now mostly they will come to me and say, hey, can you write on such and such, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, but you need to set it up and treat it like a business. And, you know, I, um, even though, you know, I knew I was meeting you, so I did do makeup today, <laughs> yes. but I get up in the morning and I dress. I don't, I don't go around in jammies. And, and I know many of us in this time of pandemic, we are working at home and that's new to us. But still, you know, treat it like a business. Get up, wash your face, shower, put on good clothes, go to work, set a schedule. I am at, you know, my husband leaves. He, he's also self-employed, but he has an outside office. So he leaves, thank you, God. He leaves <laughs> the house. I'm at work by 8.39 every morning. Yes. I try to quit by around 4.35 to, so I can get dinner ready. But when I'm at deadline, I come back to work. I'm here until midnight, whenever, until it gets done. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, when you are an authorpreneur and you are the boss of you, you have to really be tough. a bitch. Yeah, you have to be tough. You have to be tough and, and you know, don't cut yourself any slack because I'm probably harder on myself than any of my real life bosses ever were because I care so much. It matters. It's my name goes on everything. So yes. it really matters. Yes. So, so ladies, um, you know, you are the brain. It's a good thing in my world. Being a bitch is a good, you want to be number one, yep, yep. but in the dog show world, being the number one bitch is a very good thing. And in your <laughs> writing life, you want to be the top dog. 
Yep. So you heard it here. And uh, <laughs> this isn't the first time you've heard of it. Amy said it really well. And uh, <laughs> Amy, you know, this has been fantastic. I really do think maybe we could do this again in a month. Oh, I'd love it. There's so much more about publishing and writing that I think you could share with us. Um, one of the things maybe we could talk about is the whole, how do you set up a home office as a writer and entrepreneur? Ah. Um, because you and I, I have, you can't see my bookcase, but it's, it's similar to yours. And yeah. um, my husband you know, built all of these. It's wonderful. So yeah. And so I, just, I recently just purged a whole bunch of books and took them over, donated to my library yeah. so that I'd have more room. So I've got one empty shelf that I'm planning to fill very soon. <laughs> I need to do that. So yeah. ladies, this has been um, Yvonne DeVita, Smart Women Conversations with Amy Sojai. And we, uh, we talked books, we talked reinvention a little bit. We didn't say reinvention, but you know, um, we ladies, I mean, we were this and we became this and we're always on path on a journey, right, Amy? Always Absolutely. On a journey. It's Just the something. journey. It's the journey that matters. It's not, you have that golden ring destination and you're, you're looking to grab that golden ring, but really enjoy the journey because that's what makes it, that's what makes it special. And I hope that, you know, these conversations help your journey and um, get, keep you on that path. So tune in again next week. I will, um, I will talk with Amy about having her on again soon and we'll talk more books. I would love it. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.